Okay. All right. Welcome back to Sociology One here at Yuba College. Uh, thanks for bearing with us uh, with some issues, uh, uh, you know, last week. Um, I'll say more about those after our guest has uh, departed, but we have a special guest today. If you recall, last Wednesday was the uh, voter fest that we had, and I hope most of you, I did, I think, see most of you there. We didn't have as big a turnout as we want, or maybe our room was just too big. But uh, you, most of you guys were there. I don't know if you got a chance to register to vote, but that was the main reason for having that event was to encourage people to register to vote. And that was why we invited local candidates to come out was to have them talk about what they're doing and then maybe inspire you to want to get out there and vote for something or somebody. So, uh, so uh, Johal, uh, Karam Johal uh, asked to come and speak to you. Her job right now is to try and register voters, and she doesn't care what kind of voter you are. She just wants you to be an American who's eligible to vote and uh, willing to vote. So, um, so I'll let her say more. But she's from the League of Women Voters, which again is part of a nonpartisan effort uh, to just register you to vote. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi guys. My name is Karam. Um, I, you might recognize me from the event last week. I spoke very briefly. Uh, but yes, I am part of a coalition with the League of Women Voters, and we're doing nonpartisan voter registration, which, as your teacher just mentioned, means that I'm not here to encourage you to vote for any particular candidate or, re or register for any particular party. Um, this is simply voter registration. So um, today is actually the deadline to register to vote for the November 8th election, which means that all ballots have to either be in the mail and postmarked uh, by the end of today, which is usually four or five o'clock, depending on the post office, or you can register online until midnight on the Secretary of State's website. Um, but I do have some forms right here to register anybody who is eligible and interested. But before we get to that, um, let's just go over really quick. What are the requirements to be eligible to register to vote in California? There's four of them. Anybody know any of them? Yep, citizen of the U.S. Did you have one? Yeah. Same one. Okay. So, 
Yes, that is one of the four. However, as of January 1st of this year, if you're 16 or 17, you can actually pre-register to vote in the state of California, which means that you can fill out one of the forms and it'll be kept on file until you turn 18 and then it will go into effect. But yes, that is traditionally one of the requirements. Two more. If you want to vote in California, you have to live in California. You have to be a California resident. And the last one is that you cannot be in prison or on parole. However, as of next year, you can vote from county prisons. So those are the four requirements to be able to vote in California. And when should you re-register if something changes? Yes? Uh, yeah, well, last or first name. Um, anything that happens like a marriage or transitioning from one gender to another that causes you to legally change your name does require you to re-register to vote. What else? Your address. Address, yep. And? Political party preference, <laughs> um, meaning that if last time you registered to vote, you selected no party preference, but this time around, let's say that you really um, identify with Gary Johnson's platform, so you decide that you want to register with the Libertarian Party, you would have to re-register to vote. Um, so really, really briefly, let's go over the history of voting, which I know is everybody's favorite topic, but try to bear with me. Uh, what happened in 1776? What was signed? <coughs> The Declaration of Independence was signed, and under the, under the Declaration of Independence, who was allowed to vote? Men. Property owning men, which in that time translated to white men, which means that if nothing had changed in the last three or four hundred years, only a handful of us in this room would be eligible to vote or to register to vote. Um, about 80 years after that, the requirement to be a property owning man was taken away, which meant that African American men also could register to vote. But keep in mind that Native Americans, Asian Americans, and Latinos were still denied this right because they were being denied citizenship rights. And as we just talked about, being a citizen is one of the requirements to be able to vote. Uh, finally, women got the vote in the year less than 100 years ago. 1920, absolutely. Yes, that's when women got the right to vote. But it's important to keep in mind that although more and more demographics were being allowed access to registering or to voting, there were still a lot of loopholes open that allowed for discrimination. For example, polling taxes, literacy tests, and even violence and intimidation were implemented to prevent certain groups of people from registering or from exercising their vote. So if you're a black man and you go to a polling place um, in, the in the 20th century, even though you were legally allowed to register to vote and allowed to vote, there might be a mob waiting for you there to attack or intimidate you and to discourage you from wanting to vote. But it's okay because they can say, oh, no, 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 we're not discriminating because legally you're allowed to vote. So luckily in 1965, something called the Voting Rights Act passed, which granted protections um, for minorities across the states. So especially in those states that have a history of discriminating when it comes to voting rules and regulations, the Voting Rights Act said that those states and all states have to be checked so that they can't make any kind of loopholes like this possible. So everything was fine and dandy until about three years ago in 2013 when the Supreme Court struck down a really crucial part of the Voting Rights Act, the part that said that the states have to be checked, which means that those loopholes have room to be open again. Now, I can't get into too much about what that means because that can be considered a partisan issue. And again, I am part of a nonpartisan uh, voter registration drive. However, I would highly recommend Googling what's happening in other states when it comes to voting laws uh, and voter suppression. Um, but luckily for us here in California, we have it pretty easy. Um, they make it very easy for us to register to vote and we've really come a long way. So many people have suffered and died to be able to get to this point where a woman of color is here to register uh, you all to vote. So it's really important to take advantage of that. So that being said, um, keeping in mind the requirements to be eligible and when you should re-register to vote, does anybody here need to register or re-register? Yeah? Anyone else? You said you should do it online. 
You can do it online, but the online form does require uh, more information from you. Um, like a lot of the stuff on the form here is optional, uh, but online you have to fill in all of it. It's up to you. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so I just want to point out a couple of things that are on this form. I won't go over the whole thing since we only have one person filling it out. Um, but some things to keep in mind, again, about how open California is and how easy they make it for us. There are a few things on this form that are examples of that. For instance, there's an option here to describe where you live if you don't have a street address. Now, who does that benefit? Homeless people, absolutely. So that means that California does a good job of not disenfranchising the poor. And what does disenfranchise mean? Sorry, to what? Mm, close. Has to do with voting. Well, the franchise is the right to vote, right? Mm -hmm. So to disenfranchise somebody means yeah, to take away somebody's right to vote or to prevent them from voting. So it means that in California, we don't disenfranchise the poor, meaning that we don't make it a requirement to have a home address in order to be able to vote. So you can describe if you usually sleep in between intersection uh, X and Y um, to be able to still be able to cast your ballot. Um, cool. So another couple of things I want to point out is that there's a section on here that asks for either your identification either your ID number or your driver's license number or the last four digits of your social security number. But another cool thing about California is that if you don't have either of those numbers or if you don't remember them uh, at the time that you're filling out the form, you can either write down a phone number so that they can contact you at a later date and get that number from you, or you'll simply be assigned an identification number specifically for the purposes of voting. So again, I can't emphasize enough how easy they make it for us to vote here. Um, other than that, one other thing I want to point out on this form is that there is an option where it says, I want to be a poll worker on election day. Now, I don't know the specifics of this, but I do know that you can make upwards of $100 working as a poll worker on election day, which is November 8th. And in a class that I spoke in last week, uh, somebody raised his hand and said that he was a poll worker in the last election and he made $260. So I don't know if it varies by county or what the deal is there, but if you want to find out more information about that, go to your county elections website or your county registrar website and fill out the application or give them a call and ask for some more information. So that's all that I got for you. Um, it's really important, again, to get out your voice and your vote. Even if you're disillusioned by this presidential election and you don't care for either a major party candidate. There are still a lot of items on the ballot that might be important to you, like state and local races, like all the candidates that were at the event last week, or uh, a lot of propositions, like um, the legalization of marijuana, the $2 tax increase on cigarettes, or the requirement of condoms in adult films. So there might be issues that are more important to you than you thought. Um, so make sure you get out and vote November 8th. And uh, yeah, make that 260, because why not? Have a great day, guys. Yeah. You too. <laughs> All right, thank you. And uh, I think I'm not as restricted in saying certain things. So I did want to bring up this issue. Anybody know what she was talking about? Efforts underway in other states to suppress the vote. Uh, suppress the vote means try to get people to not vote. And uh, do you know what? might be uh, an example of that. So one big, yeah, uh, well, we talked about it in the social too. Changing, like, the polling locations, reducing them? Possibly. I haven't heard of that one so much, but, yeah, making it a little difficult to find where you're supposed to go do your voting. Um, one that's concerning to me is the whole issue of voter ID. So there's this uh, claim out there that says, well, they don't ask for your ID when you go vote. And it's, is that true? Uh, when you go and vote and, they, and you vote, um, you're not asked to show ID. It might be a little surprising to you at first. But they ask you your name, and then they look for your name on a list. And if your name's on the list because you've registered and your registration was approved, then they hand you the ballot. And so some states are saying, or some politicians in some states are saying, we need a voter ID law. We need to be able to ask people their um, 
you know, see their idea to make sure that there's no quote unquote voter fraud going on because couldn't somebody just show up and vote for somebody else if there's, uh, if that's going on. Um, so probably you say to yourself, well, that sounds like a good idea. Does it sound like a good idea that we need, should ask people for their ID? Why? What is it going on? I mean, so then the next question is, well, if that is really going on, then yeah, we need a law to stop that. But the next question is, is that happening a lot? Are people showing up to vote for other people and taking away their vote from them? And the answer is something like, it happens in like 0 .0000.4 percent of the time that that's happened. So in other words, it doesn't happen. Uh, I mean, it's, if it did happen, you would expect there to be a lot of reports about it. Like, I showed up to vote and I couldn't vote because somebody voted in my name, and, uh, but that doesn't happen. Everybody who wants to vote is getting to vote. So this, this idea that there's this voter fraud going on is very questionable. And uh, one of the candidates has claimed there's massive voter fraud going on, but everyone who works in elections of, of all parties says, well, we don't have any cases of that. So then they ask, well, why are they passing the law if there's no problem with it? Well, for example, some states that have voter ID say, well, you have to have ID. What ID can you show? And they might say, well, if you have like an NRA, if you're a member of the National Rifle Association and you have NRA ID, then you can vote. Okay, well, what about like my student ID? If I'm a student, can I vote? And some of those states say NRA ID is fine. From Yuba College or your college or university, that doesn't count. Um, and... Um, I just want to interject one last time, and then I'll okay, go anyway. <laughs> um, do you guys know who John Oliver is, the comedian, late night mm -hmm. TV show host? He has a really great segment on uh, this whole issue of, of voter suppression, voter ID laws, all that kind of stuff. It's like 10, 15 minutes, and he makes it really easy to understand and okay. really entertaining. Right. So <laughs> I, I would I'm not recommend... Done. Oh, I recommend <laughs> all right, I'll show that in Soch too, for sure. Um, so I just wanted to say the claim, so one side claims there's massive voter fraud going on and therefore we need IDs. The other side claims that that's a false claim, that there really isn't voter ID going on. Bye, thank you. Uh, and that in fact what's uh, really going on here is that certain groups want to prevent other groups from voting. And so the claim here would be conservatives want NRA members and stuff, Republicans want those. Why wouldn't they want students? Why would it, whose interest would it be to try and say, you can't vote just because your only ID is a student ID? Well, students like yourselves tend to be young. Young people tend to vote Democratic more often than Republican. And so if you're a Republican trying to make sure Republicans get elected, you would have a reason to try and prevent students from voting, but make it easy for national rifle people. To make, to bring up, to, to, just so I'm not being partisan here, California makes it really easy for students to vote, like 16 and 17 year olds can register to vote. California is a very blue state. We have a lot of Democrats with a lot of power in California. So if California's law says, hey, you're a student, come on out and vote and we're gonna make it easy for you, that kind of shows the power of Democrats in this state. In states that are more controlled by Republicans, those are the states more likely to try and say they have voter fraud problems and who are they trying to prevent from voting? Well, poor people, Poor and young people tend to vote Democratic more than Republican. And so if you can say, oh, you don't have a car, you don't have a driver's license, well, you don't have ID, so you don't vote. Or you don't have an address, you don't vote. But California is trying to say, you can tell us the street you sleep on and you can be a student. And so California is more of a Democratic state and trying to keep it that way, I suppose, the Democrats would like. And states that are more controlled by Republicans are, have more of an interest in trying to not have as many people vote if they're not going to vote Republican. So you always have to kind of ask yourself, what's the real reason for a law? Is voter ID, is it really to prevent voter fraud or is it to prevent non-white people and you know, students from voting and stuff? So that's at least the claim of those who say we don't need those uh, voter ID laws. Um, Anyway, so I hope you'll, can, it certainly is a historic election. And it was interesting, the, there's a bunch of ballot measures. This ballot, I think, I don't know if it set a record, but if you've gotten your sample ballot in the mail, it's 207 pages long. It's huge. 
and it's got a bunch of ballot measures, including the marijuana one, two different death penalty ones. She brought up ones that I think students might be interested in, like legalization of marijuana, taxing cigarettes more, whether you are for that or against that. Um, and so, uh, so she was trying to highlight issues that young people might be concerned about. But it's a good point to bring up. Old people vote a lot more than young people. And that's one reason politicians are mainly talking about things like Social Security and other issues that old people are really worried about, like me. Uh, if you want politicians to be talking about things that matter to you, you know, you should vote. Because if more young people vote, then they're going to have to try and uh, say things and do things that young people want to see. But if young people don't go to the polls and don't vote, then politicians have no reason to speak to you, include you in their speeches, include you in their goals. So that's my plea for why you should go out and vote, however you think about it. All right, well, we were talking about tough guys. And by the way, I just want to highlight again this notion of intersectionality, because for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about race and gender, and we're talking about them together. Race and gender are not really separable issues, nor is class really separate from it. And there's other things we could mention there, too. But this issue of voting brings it up, too. Uh, for a long time, only white, male, property people could vote. And that was what a citizen was. A citizen is somebody who's white and male and property. Nowadays, we're saying as a society, and she was pointing it out, that we expect non-white people, women, uh, poor people, to also have the right to vote. And we're including them in citizenship. So you can see how power, who has the power to run this country, is a question of intersectionality and kind of always has been since the beginning. And so you can't really talk about the power of white people without looking at its intersection with other things. You can't really talk about the power of men over women without talking about these other things. And you see it even in talking about voting and uh, that those three things tend to go together in terms of rights to vote and in terms of the issues that we face. So anyway, uh, so tough guys. And tough guys is, also, is mainly about gender, as we saw. And by the way, I want to mention to you, we didn't get to watch the second half because we had our voter thing. But you guys all can watch the second half on. Um, and did you do that already? How many have watched the second part of Tough Guys 2? Well, then I'm going to be asking you questions that you can't answer because you didn't do what I said. I think I put it on Canvas. Did I not? Please check Canvas. But I told you that if you go to the pages, there's a link called Pages on Canvas. If you click on that on our Canvas site, then you will get to the archived lectures. And then you click on those, and you can actually watch all the lectures for this class. But the most recent one is the second half of Tough Guys, too. So if you were here on Monday of last week, you saw the first part. And then if on Wednesday you did what you were supposed to and went to Motor, Vo to Motor Voter, to the Voter Fest, um, motor voter, by the way, is a term for registering people when they register to drive their car that they also get registered to vote. And I don't think California has that, but some states have that. Anyway, yeah. I thought you made an announcement on campus explicitly saying that you couldn't get the second half on the website. I said it should be up there soon. I said I wasn't there, but didn't I say it'll be up there soon? It's there now, so you need to watch the second half of Tough Guys. Everybody in this class does. It's part of the class. So. Uh, I have a real hard time these days when I tell people to do things, they just look at me and go, no, I didn't do it. So I don't know why that is, but I'm old school, I guess. When my professors told me to do things, I felt the need to do them because I was worried about my grade. And you should too, maybe. But maybe you're more power to you. Maybe you're <coughs> risen above that whole worry about grades. And you're just here for the learning, and if that's good, then I'm with you. But the truth is, your grade will be dependent on doing the things the professor asks. Um, so I had three questions that I asked you to think about as we looked at that movie. And we're going to answer them anyway, even if you didn't watch it, it would be much more understandable to you and enriching to you if you had done what you were supposed to. So the first question is, what is hypermasculinity? Or in other words, the tough guys. What did it consist of? 
you watched the video or maybe you didn't, maybe I'm just going to be talking to myself. If that's all the case, then I'll just quickly rush through this and you'll have to figure it out on your own. Uh, it's sort of the, I guess, less emphasis on um, what a male sh should act like or whatnot that that um, that their the typical male stereotype is being challenged. Uh, okay, that's a little too vague, but you were saying less, so you were making a comparative statement, so I'm asking, less compared to what? In other words, I'm going to give you this bit of it. It's less compared, or less or more compared to something, compared to how masculinity used to be. So what we're saying is it's a new type of masculinity in American culture and society. So that's part of what this video is trying to say, is that there's a new form or type of masculinity in America. Not all men are part of it, but it's a new form of masculinity out there. And remember, we, we are looking at masculinity as being a kind of mask. And literally, they're calling it a mask, a guise, or as an act. And so it's like a costume you can choose to put on or not. And there's different masculinity costumes out there one could put on. But this video is saying, this tough guy's masculinity is a new kind of masculinity that we're seeing in American culture. So I think you were trying to get at that, John. But then what does it consist of? If it's a new type of masculinity, what are some of its main features? When we, if the video is convincing, it's trying to persuade you that we see it out there in American culture. And it was trying to show you all the different things in our culture that express this new form of masculinity. And by the way, I've defined culture already in this class as how do people think or feel? And masculinity is a, a question of how people feel when they or think of the meaning of having a penis, um, in other words. And, uh, and so, but it gets expressed in terms of another word for culture is the movies and TV shows and books and songs. That's another meaning of the term culture. But you can say that those cultural artifacts, I call them, express this type of masculinity. And so what were some of the cultural artifacts they looked at? Movies, TV shows, action figures, games, other things they pointed to that expressed this new form of masculinity. And what is in that masculinity? In this new form of masculinity, is it like touchy-feely? Is it being sensitive and soft and gay? Is that what it is? What is it? Be tough. Be tough. So being tough is part of it. So physical toughness is part of this uh, new form of masculinity. It emphasizes that, and so we see it in um, various kinds of movies and TV shows and other cultural artifacts where toughness is emphasized as something that's a really masculine quality. Um, I was going to say it emphasizes violence. So violence is a big part of it. Violence as the solution to problems. Violence as, um, as a solution, but also as an identity of men presenting themselves as violent beings with large muscles, with scary postures, with weapons, other kinds of things, they pointed out that most of the violence in America is committed by men, far, far more than any other group. Um, I just keep thinking like the top dog, like, uh, is it? like alpha male kind of thing. <laughs> okay, That's so dominance, so it's not just like about sharing and helping and working together with other people, it's dominating them, crushing them controlling them, completely in charge and dominating. So like they showed examples of, it's not enough to just score the basket over the guy and dunk him, you gotta like dunk over him and then point at the guy's face. Or it's not enough to just tackle the quarterback behind the line, you gotta stand over him and show how dominating you are and how much better you are. And so it isn't just toughness, you could be tough without trying to dominate others. And it isn't just violence, because if you're violent to defend yourself, you know, that's one thing. But if it's this kind of, Domineering, physical toughness, what else about it? I could also mention something where that this is happening maybe because that the woman's role has sort of Well, we didn't get to the second question, which is why is it happening? So, but what is it? So they're saying there's this new masculinity, and a big part of the movie is them just trying to point to you of examples of it. 
in movies, TV shows, action figures. What about the action figures? What about it? What did they say about action figures? And maybe you don't know that term, but I'm talking about like G.I. Joe, little dolls that boys play with or girls play with. What was the story with the action figures? Uh, the action figures, they came more thin, like more muscular. Not necessarily fit, but just huger, largeness, size, big size. Um, <clears throat> men have not always been presented in American culture as really large and huge. And some of our heroes used to be fairly small guys. But now it's all about being huge. And big guns, too. Big, big guns in every sense of that term. Big guns, like big guns. Guys call these muscles guns nowadays. But big guns and big old guns they're carrying, too. <coughs> what else? And so the action figures, even Luke Skywalker, when he came out when I was a kid, he looked like the guy in the movie. He was a scrawny, you know, farm boy. And, uh, but the action figures that they make now of that Luke Skywalker are like some, you know, wrestler guy. So that's telling you it's not reflecting reality. People, you know, it's, but it's emphasizing a certain type of masculinity. What else could we say about it? Maybe we're glorifying, like, violent movies like Scarface and The Godfather. As being like <laughs> yes, well, I want to get at that point. Um, well, they talked about what's called the cool pose. And do you remember who specifically in America tend to point to gangsters and criminals as being their models of masculinity? Like they showed a lot of people saying, I love Scarface. That guy's Scarface. I love him. I want to be Scarface. So why would gangsters be... I mean, that was part of the violent because, thing. Like, he came from nothing. He was like a Cuban immigrant and he came to America. <clears throat> well, the point they were trying to make is um, when it comes to criminal bad guys, um, it tends to be non-white people, tends to be people who have been excluded from American culture. And so if you are like a, uh, a black kid in a poor community and you're trying to be a tough guy or you're trying to have respect as a man, for your masculinity. What kind of masculinity can you have if you tried to be like a computer nerd and I wear glasses and I'm into coding and stuff? Um, you might not get the respect as a man in that community. Um, and it wouldn't really be available to you because where did you learn to code? The school in your community doesn't have computers and no one there teaches coding. And so you've gone to a school that hasn't really allowed you to develop that side of your masculinity. So what can you do? Well, in that neighborhood, maybe being tough and big and scary is all that's really available. So a point they were trying to make is for non-white people and poor people, poor white kids too, a lot of them are drawn to the gangster image. A lot of poor white kids are starting to dress like black guys and Mexican guys because that's how we portray toughness of a tough American guy. But if you don't have a lot of money you're making at a good job or a lot of education that you got because your society made a path for you, if you're in a world where you don't really have a path to a great education or a great job, what do you have that you could show that you are somebody that deserves respect? And they said, well, being scary, being willing to kill somebody if I need to, or people think that about me, at least if people think that, they're going to be scared of me and back up when I come in the room. And so people were, um, he would, the movie was pointing specifically to gangster films, and they were talking about the cool pose. The fact that for a lot of non-white young men, um, their way of being masculine is tough and violent, but it's a particular kind of criminal tough violence or sinister kind of violence and toughness. So race, so again, the intersectionality. We can't really understand the masculinity in America without also looking at issues like race and class. So for poor people, it isn't really just race, it's poor people, black and white, are drawn to that kind of tough masculinity. So it's bigness, it's violence, it's strength. It's also another big point is invulnerability they made. Uh, the movie made. Invulnerability. Well, I'll just call it no emotions. Nothing gets to me. Nothing makes me cry or feel anything. I'm just tough inside and out. And a lot of the uh, movies are sh and culture is showing that kind of stuff. Can we also talk about sexual aggressiveness? Okay, sexual aggressiveness. 
And again, it's like a dominating thing of dominating the other person, pushing them down, that kind of thing. They talked about certain kinds of pornographic culture, you know, glorifying that type of male dominance of women. Uh, we certainly have certain candidates talking about things like that and saying, you know, bonding with other men and just saying, oh, that's just how we talk in locker rooms. We just talk about, you know, dominating and violating women. And I, that's just normal, he said. And a lot of other men were like, I don't know if that's so normal. I don't know if that's how we talk in our locker room. But that became, you know, a discussion recently in America over how do men talk about women when the women aren't around. And... Um, that was one of the issues with sexual aggressiveness. What else? Another part of it was, uh, it's been a while, so I'm helping you out here, but you should know these things and have taken notes. That's why I posed the questions, and while you're watching the movie, you go, oh, that's part of tough masculinity. Um, risk taking, riskiness, or things like, you know, high speed racing. I just was on the road yesterday, and these two motorcycle guys passed me on a double line, then they went like 100 yards and passed another car. The whole time they're in the other lane. Passed another car. Then they're going up a hill onto a bridge and they're still in the other lane. I'm like, a car could definitely be coming right now. You cannot see. And they didn't care. They were going like 90 on a rural road on motorcycles. Anyway, and I was pissed as I had my kids in the car. And I'm like, I'm not a tough guy. I'm a family man in my <laughs> minivan. And you guys are endangering me. Um, but anyway, so uh, risk taking is another part of this tough guy masculinity. It includes things like binge drinking, how much can you drink, how much can you take, how much can you stand, that kind of thing. Anything else you can think of? Can be intelligent. Huh? Can be intelligent as a part of one of those, because in every single movie, all the guys are really intelligent. Are really what? Dumb? Really intelligent. They can do whatever they want. They well, I think they were saying this particular kind of masculinity emphasizes the opposite, not intelligence, but physical. Is that what you're saying? Intelligence, but not, but like almost, well, they even said like non-curiosity, like. I think they used the example of like Good Will Hunting, like he was like really intelligent, but he mastered. But he couldn't show his intelligence. You have to pretend you don't have it, and being smart is like weak, and that's nerdy, and that's geeky. But being tough and just doing things without thinking, I don't think about it, I just do it. Uh, so that's more of the tough guy masculinity. Um, and not, being, not having curiosity, if you ask questions, then that means you don't know. If you don't know, you must be a loser. And so it's like you can't be curious, you can't have any questions about things, I already know everything. Um, so it's a very narrow kind of masculinity is what they're saying. Um, what else can we add to it? Uh, another big one, I think, is a sort of um, um, not, well, I guess what I want to talk, maybe it goes with invulnerability, or maybe, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just kind of uh, self-sufficient or self-reliant. I don't need anybody else. I'm, a, I'm an island unto myself. I don't need anyone. I don't need to talk to anyone. I don't need to talk about my feelings to you. That's for girls. And so it's this, uh, you know, just I'm um, totally tough and silent, strong and silent type kind of thing. So this is this new kind of masculinity that has these various kinds of features. And, but then the question is, the second question I posed is, well, where did it come from and why did it come from? And have we always had this? Or if it's new, when did it start emerging in the culture? And why did it? And that part of the, the video is harder to follow because, in fact, between Tough Guys number one and Tough Guys number two, they kind of changed the answer to this question. I'm going to give you an answer that kind of goes more with Tough Guys number one. They do talk about it in Tough Guys two, But then they broadened the answer, and I'll do that as well. But the basic answer to it is that it's a backlash. So the second question is, what caused it? What caused, I'll just put caused, causes. Why do we have this new form of masculinity? Where did it come from and why? And I'm saying the short answer is backlash. What's backlash? What does that mean? In sociology, it means, yeah? No, you can't. 
I mean, it means different things. We're talking about a whip. I mean, it means that's what it literally comes from, is when you whip something with a whip, you lash something, the lash comes back, right? You whip the cow, but the lash comes back to your head, right? That's the backlash. But what does it mean in sociology? Mm, close. I think it's literally just consequences. Some, one event happens, it's kind of major, and then something else happens as a result of that. It only sort of happens because of that. And that's a little too vague, too. I, what it's specific, yeah? It's more of like a retaliation. Well, it's when, when social changes happen, it specifically refers to when something happens in society to change, or in America we often talk about things progressing, so we have like conservatives and progressives. Is that a fire alarm? It's an Amber Alert. Somebody's an Amber Alert. Thank you. Um, and, so, uh, and so when big changes happen in a society, some people in that society might not be happy with those changes. And they might be trying to backlash, try to push us back to how things were before the change happened. And so, uh, you know, when people say things were better before this happened, and let's go back to how it used to be, they're speaking in terms of a backlash. And again, I'll bring Donald Trump into it when he says, make America great again. Well, some people ask, well, when was it great in your view? And so you seem to want to take us back to some other time than we are now. And you hear Hillary saying, America's great now. What do you mean, make it great again? It's better now than it's ever been. That's what I hear Obama saying, and Obama will point to all these changes. Your person who just spoke here said, it's better now that a woman of color can come here and tell you to vote than it was when women of color couldn't vote. So in her, in her view, things are better now. But some people in this world, in this country, might say, well, it was a lot better when propertyed white men were doing all the decision making, not when we let these other groups in. So when we talk about back, backlash, we're talking about back, going back to how things used to be. So the movie makes a pretty uh, you know, detailed argument here. That if we go back to the 1940s and 50s, there was a kind of traditional masculinity back then. Now the movie also made the point that this backlash, you can find it going back even further because really the challenges to men's power, which is what they're talking about here, the change in society they're talking about is the challenge to the power of white men basically. And that, that power has been challenged previously in American history. And when it does get challenged, this video was saying, uh, there tends to be backlashes against it where a new kind of masculinity gets emphasized that's like trying to go back to how things used to be. But we see it most clearly in this case. So the video says in the 1940s and 50s, there was a certain person who was held up in America as this is like the best man you can be. If you're a man and you're an American man, you should try to be this guy. Do you remember who that particular guy was, they said in the 1940s, represented this kind of traditional American masculinity? John Wayne. John Wayne. So they said John Wayne was the guy. If you were going to be a man, you need to be like John Wayne. And as they pointed out, that was already a mask in a way because John Wayne, that's not his real name. His real name was Marion Anderson, so they didn't tell you the real name of the guy. That wasn't too tough sounding. And in real life, he didn't like horses. He didn't like to wear Western wear. But on the screen, this character of John Wayne is what was being held up to people. So the movie's making a point that even then, John Wayne was a mask. It wasn't a real thing. It was a character in a movie, in movies. But anyway, he was held up as this thing you're supposed to be. In the 1960s, where a time of social movements, a bunch of new social movements, started to challenge American society. A social movement is when a group of people comes together collectively to challenge things. We started this class with the idea of the uh, sociological imagination and C. Wright Mills wrote about that in the 50s. If you want to change things, you've got to find other people who agree with you that something's screwed up, and then you've got to try to change things. And a lot of people in the 60s began to do that. Those social movements challenged this kind of John Wayne masculinity. Um, what, do we, what do we think of when we think of those movements? What was the most important social movement of the 1960s? Which group came together to demand change in the 1960s first? Civil rights movement is kind of the granddaddy of them all. 
that's the movement of, you know, Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and people like that. And how are they different than John Wayne? What was the civil rights movement was trying to say in many ways, not just we want rights for black people, which they did, but they were also presenting a different kind of masculinity. If we think of Martin Luther King, for example, in what ways was Martin Luther King not the same as John Wayne? First, he's nonviolent. Well, first, he's non-white, too. He's non-white, and to say that a non-white person could be a man, well, back in those days, black guys were often called boy. If you were a shoeshine person, you were boy. If you worked on a train, like a porter on a train, you were boy. And many black men were only allowed to take the kind of jobs where you got called boy all day long. And one of the first slogans of the civil rights movement was, I am a man. One of the first actions in the civil rights movement was the janitor strike. And these guys went on strike because they were getting, or sanitation workers, a couple of workers had gotten killed in a, uh, one of the machinery of the company. And they started to say, well, you're just treating us like trash, but also you treat us like children. And their t-shirt said, I am a man. And so to, for a, a non-white man to get up and speak to the whole country and say, I'm talking to you with the same, and I expect the same kind of ear that you would give to John Wayne or some other powerful white man, that was a kind of a big change in America to have a non-white person standing up talking to the country. But also he did it in a different way. Um, John Wayne was white. And John Wayne always seemed to use violence in the end, that that was the way. If you have a bad guy in town or the village people are being you know, threatened by some problem, well, you just come in with a bigger gun and a tougher guy, and that's how you solve the problem. But uh, Martin Luther King said, well, we actually are a minority. There's many fewer of us than there are white people, so violence isn't even really an option, because if we were going to start trying to fight our way to make our lives better, we'll probably get crushed because we're outnumbered. So that's not even really a smart move. And maybe nonviolence is actually a much better way. We'll go sit at the lunch counters, and if they try to beat us up, we'll just sit there. And if they beat us up, well, we'll let the American people decide. Is it these people sitting on a lunch counter, are they the bad guys? Or is it the guys punching them and hitting them that are the bad guys? We'll just let the American people decide. And if you have the discipline to sit there and be punched and dragged and kicked while other people are doing it, it does, it's tough. It requires a lot of toughness. Maybe more toughness than taking a gun and shooting somebody. But, so it's not a lack of courage, but it's not violent. It's, uh, it's a different way of solving your problem, of showing your strength and showing your power and showing your, your, your rightness, your righteousness. So that's what they did, and it was a powerful alternative that Americans saw. Wow, you could actually make things better not by shooting somebody, but by being strong in your convictions, what you believe, and letting the audience decide. Pretty powerful thing. And then other movements, other people began to say, wow, that worked for black people. I wonder what other groups could come together and demand change. I would say the women's movement was another big one we think of. And here, you might not be aware, I'm glad she brought it up, was the women's movement a civil rights movement in the 60s? Not really, because women really already had civil rights. We just heard, when did women get the right to vote? 1920. So why in 1960, what right are they fighting for? Well, they already had the right to vote, already had the right to own property, already had the right to work in most cases. So what was the women's movement about? And when we think of the women's movement of the 60s, what comes to mind? I don't know if you know anything about 60s women's movement, but... Jobs. No, not really jobs. Equal, equal pay. Well, the Equal Rights Amendment was one thing that they fought for. That never got passed, and we still don't have an Equal Rights Amendment that says women and men should get paid the same thing. But one of the things we think of is... So I want to talk to you just briefly here. The movie didn't cover this. But when we talk about feminism, and feminism is a bigger name for women's rights movements of various kinds, and a lot of scholars today divide it into first wave and second wave. The first wave was more about civil rights, like the right to vote, the right to work, the right to own property. And they were often known, we think of them, the suffragettes. 
And don't be an uneducated American. One time Jay Leno, the talk show host, went out and asked people, are you for women's suffrage? Are you in favor of women's suffrage? And all these, women, all these people said, no, that sounds terrible. I'm against that. It has nothing to do with suffering. It has to do with the right to vote. So the suffragettes were women who fought for the right to vote. That was first wave feminism. Second wave feminism, and so that's more like the 1890s through like the 1920s. Second wave we think of as the 1960s and 70s. And what were women talking about back then? Well, one thing we think of is like them burning their bras, women burning their bras. Why were they burning their bras and what did that signify? Well, for one thing, men who were protesting in the 60s, some of them were burning their draft cards. Because at that time, if you were a man of 18 years older, you had to register for the draft and say, OK, government, I'm 18. You can send me any war you want. And a lot of men at that time were not in favor of the Vietnam War. And so they said, we're not going to just let the government send us to die and kill in Vietnam because we don't believe in that war. So we're burning our draft cards. Now, here's another thing you might not know. And I haven't gotten to the youth movement yet. But you, young people didn't have the right to vote back then. The right, who knows when the right of 18-year-olds to vote? When did you get that? I don't even know the answer to that. I think it was 1968. So up till then, you had to be 21 to vote. And yet, you, when you were 18, you had to go fight in the war. So a lot of 18 to 21-year-olds are like, how's this fair? I have to go die for my country, but I don't get to vote on who's in office and who's declaring war and what they're declaring war about. I just have to go die for it. Doesn't sound right. Just like the whole reason we had a revolution in this country is the idea I shouldn't get taxed if I don't get to vote on how you're using the tax. So we're declaring independence from England based on not getting taxed for things I didn't vote on. Well, should you have to give your life for things you didn't vote on? I don't know about that. So a lot of Americans didn't support the Vietnam War and they were burning their draft cards. So some women burned their bras kind of in solidarity with that because women didn't have to serve in the draft. but. It was really more than that. It wasn't just saying we support our brothers who have to burn their draft cards or want to burn their draft cards. It wasn't only that. It was also saying bras themselves are oppressive. Um, it was this idea like, who are bras really for? Are they for us? Do they make us more comfortable and happy? Or are they for the men who dominate our society and want us to keep our boobs from jiggling or something like that? I don't know how you feel about bras, but every woman I know, the first thing she does when she comes home is take hers off and throw it. So that tells me when they're home and they're free, when they're really free, they don't want to have that going on. Um, but back then, too, bras were designed by men and sold by men. And so a lot of women are like, these aren't even designed by us for our own comfort. They're something other than that. But really, what the 60s was all about was the idea that the personal is political. Meaning it isn't just our public rights. There's a distinction, as I've said, between this binary opposition between public and private. And men have always been defined in our society as the public ones, like voting, economic, you know, business. Those are things that happen in the public sphere. They happen downtown or they happen in the public arena. The private sphere is like home and children. And that's always been the female sphere in American culture, the male-female dichotomy, binary. It's also um, imposed on this this binary of public and private. And the first wave feminism, we're saying we want public rights. We want the right to vote. We don't want to just be stuck at home all day taking care of children. We want jobs. We want to vote. We want to hold office, all those things. So they were saying we want public life. And these second wave feminists, in a way, were saying, well, even the private sphere is a place where we don't have rights sometimes. We have to wear bras privately. We, in the bedroom, is another place where women didn't feel they were necessarily getting equal treatment. I mean, for example, it was a woman's job to make sure her man was satisfied. And a lot of men back then didn't think it was my job to make sure you're satisfied. Well, I'm finished. I guess we're done here. And I don't know about your relationships, but, uh, you know, you might need a little more attention. She might need a little more attention than you got, or the same attention you got. Anyway, the point is, is that was a political issue for some women, is, is pleasure in the bedroom, is that just for the men? Or can women have some of that too? And is it our job to serve you in the bedroom? Or is it your job to serve us, or are we serving each other equally? What is it about in the bedroom? And you know, other roles at home, like who should do what at home, like housekeeping and stuff like that, and child rearing and stuff. 
So really you could say the, uh, that second wave feminism was really more about the kinds of things that we don't normally talk about because they're private matters. Abortion was another one. Do I have the right to end a pregnancy if it wasn't what I wanted? So these were more like private matters um, for women that were also political. And uh, third wave feminism is more like Madonna in the 80s and women saying, well, we can still be sexy and still be feminine, but still have rights and still be as the same respect as men and power and all those things. So we're not going to talk much about third wave feminism, but maybe we should. But the 60s were the time of second wave feminism. And so this women's movement, well, John Wayne's male, for one thing. And the implication was males are the ones that save the town and save the village. They're the heroes. Women are just the victims. They're the ones that need the men to come save them from the victims. He's the hero. And um, a lot of women said, well, we can save ourselves. We don't need you to be the hero. We can be our own heroines. Thank you very much. And so it was, uh, you know, non-males calling for respect and... Um, and also, um, and so what other movements were there? Well, the youth movement. The youth movement was a kind of a student movement, but also an anti-war movement, because as I said, the people fighting the war were young people. And you could get out of fighting the war if you went to college, if you got what was called a student deferment. So a lot of young men decided I'll go to college and I'll get out of the draft that way. But a lot of them were feeling guilty, like just because I'm on the path to middle class life, they're not making me fight the war. But my brothers who couldn't get into college or university or just high school guys, they have to go fight it. So it's not really fair on a class basis that the more middle class people who can afford to get in college and are ready to go to college, they're getting to not have to fight the war. But the working class guys, the uneducated guys, they're the ones going off to die. So it became a linked thing. The students wanted power in the universities. One of the things was the universities were treating them like little kids and saying things like, you can't have a girl in your room at, the, at nighttime. And they're like, well, we're like 20 years old now. I think you're not my mom. I think if she wants to stay here tonight, that's my business, not yours. And so they were fighting for power in the universities and colleges. But they were also saying, well, we're fighting for our brothers and sisters over there in Vietnam War dying, you know, and so it became linked. And one of the things they said was, you know, don't trust anyone over 30. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Bob Dylan, but he was a great singer at the time. He just got the uh, Nobel Prize for Literature the other day. I was excited because he's like one of my favorite artists out there. And, uh, but he, uh, I don't know if he necessarily deserved that prize because he's more of a song guy, a musician, than a literary guy. But anyway, what he's famous for was being the voice of young people at that time and being somebody who seemed to say, well, just because you guys are older and making all the decisions and sending people to die in the war, that doesn't mean we, the young people, think you guys are smarter and we don't think it's a good war and we don't think you guys are running the country very well. And we might be young, but you guys are stupid and, uh, and corrupt. And so this became this thing that the older people are the ones that are corrupt in their ways and are ruining the country and ruining lives for people. And also, we got even more pronounced than that because a lot of young people were into new things like marijuana and drugs and other things. And they were beginning to see things in different ways than the older people did and saying, well, you guys just don't really see the truth the way we do. And so he was an adult and that, again, was... Uh, part of the challenge. You don't have to be over 30 to know what's going on. And one of the things Bob Dylan was famous for saying was, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows, was one of his song lyrics. And then there was a group of radical guys that started calling themselves the weathermen and started doing things you know, to change the society. But I, think I bring that up too, because a guy just died today, or last night, Tom Hayden, who's an old friend of my dad's, who was one of these fiery student radicals back in the day. And, uh, Anyway, uh, he was part of the weatherman at one point. Anyway, or kind of, anyway, so. But then also the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender movement started in the late 60s. 1969, actually. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't gay people before that. There have been gay people all of human history. But in those days, in America, being gay was basically illegal. 
if you wanted to find other gay people, you had to go to places called gay bars. And if you went to those places, sometimes the cops would come and start arresting everybody because in certain states and cities, it was illegal to even look for other people to have relations with. So they said, if you're at this bar, you must be looking for other men to be with, so you're violating the law. So they would just go arrest people at these bars all the time. And on one particular day in, a, in an area called Stonewall of New York, there was a riot where the gay men in the bar started saying, no, we're not going to just hide from our gayness. And you can't just arrest us. And we're going to fight back. And so they created a disturbance. And it got in the newspaper. And it began the movement of gay people saying, you know, we're not just going to hide. We're going to come out of the closet. We're going to be proud of who we are. We're going to you know, be open about it. And now here we are. 40 years later, 50 years later, and now gay marriage has been legalized by the Supreme Court. So that movement had a lot of, you know, success, you could say, in changing what it was trying to change. We think he was heterosexual. I don't know. I didn't uh, read his diary or anything like that. But John Wayne was certainly presented as a guy that likes girls. And um, so all of this was dominant masculinity at the time. We can say traditional masculinity. We can say dominant, meaning there were certainly men who didn't fit all this in American culture, but they weren't considered the highest up there as far as men goes. But all of this challenged that. And so then what happens? Well, that's getting us closer to the backlash. But the 1970s, what happened in that decade that helped create the backlash? One thing that happened was the loss of the Vietnam War. America was the strongest, most powerful, most wealthy, wealthiest, I should say, nation on earth. We were fighting a war against Vietnam, which was a very small third world country, not rich, not industrialized, not strong militarily. We thought it was going to be easy to go kick butt on the North Vietnamese and you know, take control of North Vietnam again. But uh, in, in, in 1974, we left the country, uh, not being able to stop the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, from taking over the, the country. And so we lost that war. And so many, many Americans, and there was another thing, the 19, you know, uh, well, the hostage crisis, I would bring up. When uh, Carter was president uh, from 1976 to 1980, Iran took a bunch of uh, Americans hostage, or the, the revolutionaries in Iran did, because uh, there was a revolution in Iran, and they took a bunch of Americans hostage, and America seemed kind of powerless to get them back. The Ray, uh, Carter was president, and he kept you know, saying, well, we're trying to get them back, and we can't get them back. They're still being held prisoner. Both of those things made some Americans begin to say, somehow America's gotten weakened. Somehow we couldn't win this war, and somehow people are taking our hostages. So we must be a weak country somehow, or the world sees us as weak. You hear a lot of this same uh, terminology today from some political candidates saying that we're weak, or people see us as weak, so we got to do something about this. And so it was this perception of weakness, I'll call it. Another one was Carter also gave a speech in, towards the end of his term called the malaise speech, where he said Americans were just under a malaise, meaning they were depressed or something. Instead of being optimistic and saying, we're great people that are full of hope and drive, he was saying, well, we're all kind of depressed or something. And so people started to react against this. And so the 1980s are the period of backlash, where it's kind of like John Wayne comes back. John Wayne got challenged by the 1960s, and then in the 1980s, John Wayne comes back and takes control of America again. Well, John wasn't John Wayne himself, but who did the video point to as the person, the figure, who came back into the saddle, as it were, and took over America again? Ronald Reagan. So Ronald Reagan is part of this backlash of Americans, especially these kinds of white male, violent, using adult, heterosexual males saying, we want to be in charge again. We're putting a guy like John Wayne in charge again. And Reagan was against all these movements that I just talked about. I'll tell you a little story because my dad, as I kind of hinted, 
what my parents were part of what was called SDS. During the 1960s, the biggest student group that protested the war and other things was a group called Students for a Democratic Society. And um, they started with just like 30 people, my parents included. This guy, Tom Hayden, who died last night, um, he was the real founder of it. And they were just 30 people. They wrote this paper called the Port Huron Statement that got put in newspapers and stuff. And they were saying, we're the young people of today. And here's how we see America. And here's what we think is wrong with America. This is our manifesto. And we think America should become less military, you know, less dominating other countries, more peaceful, give more rights to women and non-white people. And so they were saying all these things like that. By the end of the 60s, SDS went to a million people, so it grew quite a bit, and it was on like every college campus, and it was very active in challenging the war. So my parents were among the founders of it, and when Ronald Reagan, he used to be governor of California, and my dad got hired to teach at UC Santa Barbara in 1968, well, 69. And Reagan was governor of California, and so he didn't hire my dad, this university did, but he said to the to the paper, to the LA Times, Reagan did, he said, hiring flax at UC Santa Barbara, that's like putting a pyromaniac in charge of a fireworks factory. Meaning he thought, well, this guy's a student radical, my dad, and if you let him be a professor with all these students at UC Santa Barbara, then he's gonna start all these riots and stuff. Um, the Bank of America did burn down a couple months after my dad got there, but no, he, he, had, <laughs> he had nothing to do with that. In fact, he was sick at the time because one reason we left Chicago is because he had gotten beaten almost to death in his office by somebody who was pro-Vietnam War and anti-student movement. So my parents basically fled Chicago for their lives but came to this, to Santa Barbara, to lead a quiet life and raise children. And so they were not interested in being student radicals at that point. But anyway, Ronald Reagan mentioned him in this speech, you know, saying, that we shouldn't have student radicals and stuff like that. He was also against the women's movement and the gay movement and all those things. And so electing him as our president was in some ways saying, you women's movement go away, civil rights movement go away, you know, gay people go away, we want John Wayne in charge again. And one of the movies that came out at that time was called First Blood. Everyone calls it Rambo nowadays. But Rambo too was a movie that was talking a lot about this backlash. And Rambo was a Vietnam vet who said, well, we would have won the war if you just let us fight it. If it wasn't for all those women and hippies and gay people stopping us from being strong, we would have won the war. And he made another movie called Rocky. And Rocky showed this small, poor, white guy rising to the top and beating the Muhammad Ali guy, the really powerful, famous black boxer. He wasn't Muhammad Ali in the movie. He was Apollo Creed. And a recent movie came out about that. But anyway, uh, that movie too seemed to be kind of backlash of saying, well, you thought white guys were knocked down back then, but we're back up on our feet and we're kicking ass now. And so that's the movie, our movie, Tough Guys, is pointing to that as part of the backlash. And from there, a whole bunch of TV shows that start to show Tough Guys. Uh, other movies, you know, like all the weapons movies, Terminator movies, guns getting bigger, muscles getting bigger, stronger guys, faster guys. At the same time, as they pointed out, women got smaller. Because back in the 1950s, Marilyn Monroe was like the ideal woman, and she was kind of, not chunky, but not Kate Moss, not like a little stick. And so, um, and Jane Mansfield. So women used to take up more space in the magazines and stuff like that. Now they're like smaller and thinner and weaker looking. And the men look all strong and powerful. So just as women got more actual power, we have more women with more powerful positions, but our images of women got smaller and weaker. And men actually lost power in our society, but their image got bigger and stronger. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but And action figures. In other words, what I'm pointing to here is tough guys culture. This tough guys constructed culture. Again, it's not all Americans saying we want to be tough guys. It's a certain segment of the culture that owns our TV stations and movies, production studios and toy production companies. They're the ones who decide what kinds of culture gets made. And so that's part of, and so one of the arguments of the movie is that 
White men, like, well, let's take Roger Ailes. Roger Ailes is the guy in charge of uh, Fox News. He recently had to leave his job because he was assaulting all these women. And he joined the Trump campaign. And it looks like to me, if when Trump loses, as I predict he will, Roger Ailes and Trump are going to go start their own TV station. You can mark my words. That's what's going to happen. And so, because he's not at Fox News anymore, and Trump wants his own station, and that's, I'm sure, what will happen. But anyway, Fox News... Um, has for a long time been guys like Rush Limbo and Gary and Beck and Hanty and all these guys are guys that aren't for feminism. They say women, like one thing Rush Limbo likes to say about women who want rights is they're just ugly women. Ugly women want rights because they can't find a man to take care of them. So that's his view of why women want equality is because it's just the ugly women. But the pretty girls don't want that. Um, Anyway, so it's not all men that think this way, but powerful men tend to be more interested in the backlash because it's their power that has been challenged. And so they're some of the ones that have been creating a lot of this culture that is this tough guy's culture. And so, but the movie, so in the first tough guys, this is the basic argument they made. This one, if you pay attention, they go back further than the 50s because they show you this backlash actually has happened several different times in American and world history. Like in the 19th century, in the 1890s, we were talking about first wave feminism. In the 1890s, women challenged men's power too and started to say, we want jobs, we want to vote. And at that time too, there were some men who wanted to create culture that was kind of backing, backlashing to an earlier time. They mentioned the whole Boy Scouts, the creation of the Boy Scouts, and saying what a boy should be is tough, be able to take care of himself out in the woods, be able to build a fire. I mean, in some ways, the way the movie was saying is, that's not what, those aren't skills men in today's world actually need. Those are like, you know, retro skills. So the Boy Scouts are kind of saying, let's imagine we were like back in times when men needed those skills. It's not a reality they were really dealing with. But anyway, so this backlash isn't the only time it's happened. But you really see it clearly here because the 60s were such a time of major change in America. So major that I think we're still, as a country, trying to figure out where we stand on them. And in some ways, the whole election right now is still an election, still a debate we're having about these changes of the 1960s where non-white people, non-heterosexual people, uh, non old people all began to say we want a little more rights in the society and uh, so we're still trying to decide where do we stand on that and was it positive for the society or not and plenty of people like Hillary Clinton and and the Obama family think America's better now that a lot of other people have rights and can help run things and that things are better than they used to be and then you have certain kinds of people saying no let's those, those aren't better, those people aren't doing a good job, and our America looks weak, or something like that. I saw one today where Trump was, I guess, saying he thinks America's the laughing stock of the whole world, and then other people were saying, well, yeah, because of you. But anyway, um, but that's, I'm not taking a stand on it, I'm just saying both sides are, that's the debate we're having about what, what is American strength? And what, and in some ways, what is a, a good American man? Is it, uh, or a good American woman? Is it Hillary Clinton or is she a nasty woman, according to some claims? Or is it Donald Trump or is he unfit to be president and temperamentally too thin-skinned and emotional and too quick to pull the trigger? So we as a society are even still asking, what do we want from our women? What do we want from our men? And who do we want to hold up as role models for our kids, um, our daughters and our sons? And a lot of people are saying neither one of them. Other people are sure which one they feel. But we seem to, as a society, still be dealing with these questions of uh, gender and race and class and these changes in the society of who should have the power or not. The other question is, what are the consequences? So the third question I posed is, why does it matter if guys are acting like tough guys out there? So, and specifically, what we meant is there are consequences. Consequences for our society, that's the argument the movie's making. And again, I keep saying the argument, because I'm not saying the movie is fact or truth. I'm saying this was one person's or several people's perspective on things. And we as college students and college professors should take it as that and ask, well, what were they trying to say? What was the argument they were trying to make? What evidence did they use? We just went over some of the evidence about how things have changed and what's going on. 
Um, and then also in making their argument, they want to say it matters that this has happened, that we've created this new form of masculinity. Why does it matter? So again, I'm not saying it's truth. We will ask after we finish looking at their argument, well, what holes might we poke in it? What wasn't convincing about it? What counterexamples could we point to that America isn't a tough guy masculinity society? So I mean, there's many points we could make in opposition to the video. But first, what we're doing is trying to understand what it was saying. So what were some of the consequences and uh, problems? That, I guess. We've become a more violent society. So they were giving you a lot of rates of violence. I mean, they didn't really bring up the point I brought up in here that violent crime has actually gone down in America. That's a good thing. But nevertheless, most of the violence that does happen is caused by men. And it was things like what? Well, mass shootings. Mass shootings. Let's talk about the mass shootings for a second because that one's a little... They, started the movie with that, with Columbine, but it's a little different argument they were making there. But, uh, but all the different forms of violence that they were talking about, like assault and murder and rape and um, those kinds of things. Uh, so they're all dominated by men. Now, obviously one argument some people would make is that's just testosterone. That's just, uh, that's how males are built. They kill people more than women do. And women just don't have that internal biological cause of this kind of behavior. And the movie tried to dispel that idea. Um, for one, you know, um, women's violence rates have been increasing in America. So if it was just a matter of biology, we would have to find some biological cause of that. And there isn't a biological cause of women being more violent. It's not like they have more testosterone now than they used to. There are social reasons for it. As women have gotten more power and have been allowed to act more like men always have, they're acting more like men always have. So that's not testosterone. That's social construction of gender. In other words, if we allow women to be more violent and we don't you know, look down on them for that, then some of them are being that way. But anyway, so this movie was trying to say, we always look for the cause of violence on something other than gender, even though gender is the number one variable that's correlated with it. Um, so they were pointing out, like, when shootings happen, school shootings happen, they're like, what was it? Was it the video games? Was it mental illness? Was it bad parenting or something like that? Well, if you point to all those things, then you would expect women to be doing it too because girls experience all those things too. Lead paint was another one. Um, well... If it was those things, why are males' rates so much higher than girls? Again, we have to look at rates of behavior, and that's what we're doing. It's a social fact. Men commit much more of this behavior, and those rates can't be explained by just the biology of it. Um, they were trying to, in the video, make the case that um, it's, it's more the social construction of masculinity, and part of it is that we never even think of it. Um, there's a way that gender is that uh, we tend to de-gender things. I mean, this isn't really part of the point, but news stories and a lot of things, when we try to understand our social problems, we try to de-gender our discussion of them as if gender never matters. But if we made gender the central thing we were looking at, maybe we would be asking different things about why so much violence happens. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to let you go, but school shootings is another one, but that's a little different because school shootings sometimes were reactions to tough guys. So guys like Dylan Claybold and Eric Harris, they were getting picked on and bullied, so bullying would be a consequence of the tough guys. But then sometimes bullying then leads to further violence, like school shootings. And so, uh, so it's more complicated than just tough guys shooting up their school. All right, uh, we will come back to this and to the whole question of race and gender on Monday. Remember, we don't have class on Wednesday because uh, it's a day of professional development for faculty. So don't come here.